James Wan is fantastic. He is very, very clear about what it is that he wants. And he has the ability to have that kind of strength and that clarity about putting his vision on the screen and at the same time be very collaborative. You go near my family and I will cut out your guts like I did your friend. He wasn't my friend. He was my brother. The fact that he's a younger director helps him connect with all the rest of the guys. He speaks to the guys in their language, and it's his language as well. He's got a great vision. The way he shoots is right up my alley. I like the way that he really is able to capture the grittiness and edginess, especially that this film sort of uh, demands. James has a style in which he moves the camera constantly. We did some of the most bizarre and crazy things I've ever done on a film, actually, with the camera. It was about making it very raw, very real, and then putting this look and style on top of that. Choices of whether the camera's sitting on a tripod or a dolly or, or not, and in this movie, not. It's really exciting. Okay, so um, yep, one there. This is I'll get Kevin in the background again, get a bit of my perspective happening in the background. He is so visual. It's such a pleasure to work with a director who's as visual as him because he really inspires you to keep pushing yourself further to find more interesting, even more crazy ideas. I feel sort of lucky to be, you know, on the ground floor of somebody that I think is going to be around for a long time and is going to do a lot of great films. One of the things that attracted me to the uh, script was the character of Nick Hume, played by Kevin Bacon. The thing I liked about the character was I felt that there's a great character arc, stunning him off as this like everyday husband, dad, office guy. See what you miss when you don't come home? Yeah, well, at least they're not throwing food. My character is not, for the first part of the film, a traditionally heroic character. He doesn't start out as a badass. He kind of transforms the, through the film into that. The scene that really shows that transformation is the scene where um, he's arming himself, prepping, you know, all his guns. Here's a guy who's never fought a gun before. He's got a, a, a manual, you know, on how to use a firearm. He's like, he's looking at the gun, you know, like it's some strange alien thing, right? And he's trying to work it out, but at the same time, he's transforming and becoming one of these guys. And the ultimate depiction of that is, you know, he ends up shaving off all his hair, you know? He physically transformed, and he becomes looking like one of these gang members. And I think that was part of the appeal for Kevin, to play someone that, you know, he could literally change, you know, from one side of the coin to the other side of the coin. Yeah, it's the kind of stuff that actors love, and it gives them a lot of fun things to, uh, to play with. I'm a big fan of um, American muscle cars. One of the things I wanted to do was um, have the muscle cars have the same kind of tattoo designs on them as the gang members have. You have transportation and they bring in pictures of cars and James picks out what he wants. We'll need certain ones for the car chases, certain ones we're gonna crash. Then I've gotta sit there and figure out how many cars I'm gonna need. Okay, I need one or two for second unit. James needs one for first unit. We're gonna crash this number of cars. One's gonna explode. We had to rebuild the motors, put new motors in them. I had to upgrade brake systems so we can get the cars to slide. Little tricks of the trade that goes into the mechanics of the visuals of what we need to make these operate. What you don't see is a lot of the uh, substructure I had welded into these cars for when they're crashing into things, so I can protect the driver as well as pieces of the car. a huge budget picture, sure you can go out and buy six of these and blow them up. On a medium budget picture like ours, you want to be careful. You want to get everything done and save that for last. The movie really is about two families. You have Kevin's family and then you have Billy Darley's family as well. My character's name's Billy Darley and I play the leader of this gang. My father, Bones, who is sort of a hard-as-nails kind of a gunslinger, has a gun shop, hardware store. We work for him, and my guys work for me. And I think stylistically there's an element to the gang that feels like a Western. I love the look 
of the gangsters. You know, when I look around at all the guys, we all have our own very distinct look. We've got our cars, we've got our guns. We're like the modern day version of the posse that rolls into town and starts messing with the, <laughs> with the sheriff. Why don't you show a little respect at least? See, that is why you guys are nothing. That is why you are a bunch of punks, because you would rather drink up and talk yourselves witless. That was the most fun thing, was, you know, just like getting Garrett into the uh, wardrobe and hair and makeup, right? Just shaving off all his hair, putting tattoos on him, and the guy just transformed into like 180%. He's a leader, so he carries himself a certain way, and then you need to have the clothing that fits that. This really amazing leather jacket just showed his whole figure and could have had, like, you know, shotguns underneath that if he needed to. You know, we wanted them all in dark colors, dark reds and blacks and dark browns and grays. It's the kind of stuff, as a filmmaker, it's just, you know, really fun to play with, and it's such a big part in telling this particular story. A big part as to why I picked this film is it allows me to branch out a bit and do something a bit different from the horror films that I'm well known for, and tackle another movie in a genre that I also love, which is, um, action thriller. It's always interesting but nerve-wracking to move genres, but again, uh, in sitting with James and spending hours with him in pre-production, it was pretty clear that we were in sync as to what we wanted to make. I'm a big fan of the revenge genre. I like some of the classic revenge films from the 70s and the early 80s. I've always kept an eye out for a movie that is kind of like in this vein, like um, Rolling Thunder, Death Wish, or even Mad Max for that matter. I realized that one of the things I need to do to set myself apart from you know, all the sort of bigger summer blockbuster films that has a lot of money to work with is to make it really guerrilla, make it realistic, to have that same adrenaline pumping feel to it, but try and ground it in reality. It's very easy for the horror movie directors to just kind of stay in that, you know, in that genre. And his commitment to do something that was not horror, I was, you know, really impressed with. The chase starts off in the middle of a busy city street. Kevin runs for his life through back alleys, into the kitchen of a restaurant, through a basement, out into a parking garage. <laughs> With the actual chase through the parking garage, I was thinking, how can I make this different? Do something that we haven't really seen before. And I said, wouldn't it be cool if we tried to do it all in one shot? He says, I want, I want to follow Kevin. Then, you know, John, I want to, like, pass the camera through this railing as Kevin climbs over it. And then the camera would pull all the way back to the edge and there'll be a guy sitting on like a giant crane. He'll literally grab the camera and then like drop all the way down and then someone else at the bottom will pick it up and run with the camera. And then I'll then put it on another crane and bring it up and find Kevin again and take the camera off and then follow him up the fifth ramp to the top. John, I want to do it all in one shot. And so I said, okay, I think we can do it. We built a little rig, I guess you could call it, and it was a, a rectangle with bars, and you could literally grab it and pass it. It ended up being seven operators, two different camera assistants, two cranes, passing the camera off to the two cranes and back to operators. I had to be at Video Village and try and coordinate all of it with a walkie-talkie, but it was so tricky because you could have all this great stuff leading up to the very last moment, but at that very last moment, if the timing was off, guess what? You have to start over again. We did this shot for 12 hours, trying to get one good one, and I was exhausted. I mean, I was just panting and, you know, breathing and just ready to throw up on my shoes. But it was great. This is an amazing, amazing sequence, and this one shot, I have to say, is pretty cool. wanted to choreograph a lot of the fights to be very realistic and very scrappy. You have this business guy, this office guy, you know, you can just imagine the way he fights would be just very down and dirty, you know, just like grabbing whatever he can and just literally fighting for his life. He's not a man of violence, so he shouldn't want to fight. He's got to reach within himself and figure out how he's going to hurt these people. 
We spoke a lot early on so that any kind of situation that I'm in looks organic to who I am. And I'm gonna run in a certain way, and trip in a certain way, and move in a, in a kind of way that feels not like an action hero, but like a real guy. What makes a great season athlete? He's very adroit with his physical skills. We could rehearse two or three or four times, and I'd see Kevin compute it, and then he'd rehearse it, and then we'd fine tune it, and it you know, all within a period of 10 or 15 minutes, and shoot. One of the scenes is when um, Garrett Hedlund and his gang comes to uh, Kevin's house to get to him. One of the things I really wanted to do, and Kevin is so good about this, was I really wanted to film it in such a way where you would see like the bad guys there shooting at him and the shots hitting the wall, but with Kevin in the same frame as well. So like you watch it and you go, oh my goodness, that's really him in danger there. I like to experience as much safely of the physical life of the character as possible, whether it comes to biting or running or jumping or whatever it is. The minute you say action, I mean that the emotion's there. He just turns it on. It's that's a pro. Hume's being chased by the gang. The whole sequence is a lot of very fast cuts. One of my aims was to shoot action scenes in a uh, very realistic way. I wanted the chase to be guerrilla style, you know, shot from the hip. It's got a very documentary feel to it in a way that we're sort of not used to seeing action scenes in a very traditional Hollywood action film. It was something that we discussed in the beginning for a lot of these foot chases. You keep the cameras moving, you're going to keep the audience moving with it. We used this rig called the rickshaw, which is basically bicycle tires in a rickshaw looking like thing that our grips built. And we put our camera operator in it because there's no way we could have kept up if we couldn't have a cart. We also use this thing called a mule. That's like a four by four fast golf cart with a good suspension. And so we could rig cameras all around that. You could, could go really fast, really quick. So you could get close safely to say Kevin or the gang members running. It's not your big special effects action film. This is mostly very in-camera, real, and organic, and raw. And action! We came out here to uh, Columbia, South Carolina, because we wanted a very generic-looking city. And Columbia was great, because Columbia can basically be passed off as, you know, anywhere USA. We found an abandoned mental asylum. I just love the concept so much. I'm like, this is a real abandoned mental asylum. I'm going to work this into the film. So the gang members have taken over this asylum and they have literally turned it into a meth lab. Originally, the script was through a motel, but we fell in love with the hospital so much. We were like, why not make it an abandoned mental hospital? Which made it more interesting for me because like, I actually used all of the old props for a lot of the design like when you came into the uh, mental hospital i stood beds up on their end to create walls so that you had to go a certain way and then you could shine light through it and you could just see these eerie hospital pieces i love to take locations that aren't supposed to be something and turn them into something else help you i need guns bones garage was an old laundry facility when you watch them come in, you'll see all the industrial washing machines to the left. Designing his desk, I had took two partner desks and cut a piece of acrylic out so he could sit comfortably in it and like made a special chair for him that used to be like the inside of a car bench. And then I made the safe so it was part of the wall. So it almost was like a secret door. If I can add something to the story, like by doing something cool and funky like that, that's the most gratification for me. Not necessarily building this huge, enormous set. It's more just about helping the story have more of an interesting, more of an interesting twist. Action! The 
chase leads into a fight inside a car that starts to roll back towards the edge of the structure leading up to the car going over the edge. I want to show some of the shots kind of like in wide shots so we came up with a way of driving the car but without being seen. I'm actually in the trunk. The back seat's behind me so, so all the foot pedals have been moved into the trunk and that way you can have cameras all around this car. It looks like the car is drifting when in fact it's him driving it. He could literally slam on the brakes if it gets too close to the edge. We built a second rig where we had a hydraulic lift so we could simulate the car starting to fall over where we could get Kevin climbing out and jumping into some pads. We had a stunt guy who literally had to be on the front on the hood of the car and he had to time it so that he would leap off at the very last minute. We designed a rig for a Kevin stunt double. We put a harness system on it and a cable to his chest. So I said, Steve, no matter what happens, if you're late, we're going to pull you out of there and you're not going over the edge of this. Nowadays, people see this, they say, oh, well, it's a digital effect. That's easy to do. But when you really do it for real, it's, uh, it's not all that easy. Ah! 